Hi, it's Rory from the YouTube channel Counselling Resource and I'm with Bob Cook from the YouTube TA Therapy and today we're talking about assessment. Now you know Bob, a lot of my learners when they're first coming into practice, they've not met clients before, mm, it's true. always ask me how do I assess, what can I work with, what would I struggle with, a lot of fear around that sometimes or concern. You've had a lot of experience yeah. in assessing people, so yeah. what's the first point that you come from? Where's your first point? My first point actually, besides finding out what they want, is to ask what I think is a really, really important question to ask. And that is, have you had any counselling or psychotherapy before? Ah. Because once you ask that question, you're straight into their mental health background. Yes. So you're straight into them saying things like, yes, well actually I've been to GPs, or I've actually seen a psychiatrist, or I've done no mental health work before, or you're, or you're the first person I've seen, but you get a glimpse into their mental health yes. fragility. Yes. And I guess that if you work with someone who's seen a psychiatrist and a psychologist, have counselling, maybe into the GP and beyond medication, all which, all which are valid things to support people, mm. it gives you an idea of maybe the route you'll take to the next question. Yeah, absolutely, because you want to know from them um, not only what is they want from therapy or what does they want from counselling, but um, you want to know their, I suppose what you really want to know is you want to know some idea of how to assess their ego state capacity and particularly their mature adult. Mm. Now, the first phrase, ego state capacity, was more of a transactional analyst yes. term, but when I say mature adult, what I mean is how how can they maintain their adult level of functioning mm. in the world today? So you're attempting to assess, are they able to stay in the here and now? Mm -hmm. Can they function from an adult place? And if not, where do they actually go in terms of, do they go back to some aggressive place? Mm -hmm. um, are, is there some type of psychosis? Are they out of touch with reality? or what stops them functioning the way they want to function. So a good question simply would be, as I've said, um, tell me a little bit about what stops you getting what you want. Okay, so I guess what I'm hearing you talk about is something that in the person-centred world, and certainly with Roger's ideas, we talk about the first of the necessary and sufficient conditions, which is psychological contact. You're yeah. assessing their ability for psychological contact, this notion of I guess, and correct me if I'm wrong, is it possible to start to form a therapeutic relationship and at what level? Yeah, can you have a human to human contact in a way where both of you are in the room together? Yes, yes. So right from the beginning, if, I guess if you've got someone with a psych psychosis who might not be in the here and now, might be unwell, maybe um, disassociated or disconnected from our reality, as, it, as, as we perceive mm. it, then you would guess you have another decision to make in terms of the path that this assessment will go. Yes, and of course what's very important is your development as a trainee. Yes. In other words, where are you in your training? Yes. Have you been trained to be able to help this person with what they want to achieve? Now, for many people of course, you might be seeing your first client. Mm. Now if somebody comes in the room and says, well actually, you know, um, I've got problems with uh, alcohol, or I've been binging for the last 10 years, or I'm delusionary, or I've got mental health problems which, you know, prevent me to have some, you know, have some psychosis, or then they're not the sort of people that you want to work with. You need to refer them on. So there's a clear, a clear message at the beginning. If you're a trainee, or you're new in practice and you're getting multiple presentations, it could be substance misuse, it could be issues I guess around self-harm or, yeah. or very present, pressing suicidal thoughts or even somebody who clearly is unwell 
who's not in the same reality. They, they may be hearing voices, they may be having delusionary visions. Then for the new in practice therapy, well, I use the word novice, although it's not a word I, I kind of like, but the novice therapist is, is a clear referral pathway. Yeah, and it's very important to have your contact phone numbers to give to that person. To have access to a psychiatrist, GPs, people that you can refer on to. Yes, yes. So before the meeting, you have sometimes it's referred to as a little black book, um, <laughs> yes. or, or the contact numbers, or at the very least, the contact number, I'm guessing, of if it's within an organisation, the referrer, mm. the practice manager. Absolutely. Really important uh, because it's unprofessional, let alone perhaps uh, certainly not protective if you've got no um, phone numbers or no referral agents for the person to go Absolutely. to. Absolutely. And that's at any level of the therapeutic yeah. relationship, isn't yeah. it? Yes. Yeah. And uh, of course, again, you know, I think it's really important at one level to make life easy for you when you're first starting out. Yes. So, you know, there's a phrase I particularly like, which is, you know, the worried well. Ah. Uh, <laughs> yes, that's, that's... Say a little bit about that. Say a little bit. Then. Well, I, it's, it's something that, that one hears as a trainee um, the worried well, and I guess the worried well are people who are coming to you for relationship issues, they might have low self-esteem, um, they may be dissatisfied with life, but the key thing is, is, that, is that they will be in a position where they are understanding their own reality. And when I say that, Bob, you know, I, I, we're sitting here, I'm on a chair, I'm seeing you, you've got a very nice shirt on today, if oh, I don't, you don't mind me saying. Nice, nice, nice. But there is a sense <coughs> that we share a, a common reality. Yeah. And I, I, I share a little story. One, many years ago, one of my colleagues in training um, met a client on her own, without, on, at the practice without anybody there, which is very, very dangerous. Mm. Um, very dangerous. Very dangerous indeed. And what happened was that the person she was meeting, the client became unwell, started to react to voice hearing, wow. started to react to delusions. Wow. Now it's important to say that people with psychosis are a hundred times more likely to be the victim of crime statistically than the perpetrators of it. However, it was very frightening for a <coughs> new therapist. That's right, that's right, for a new therapist. And she ran out of the door Oh. Without, without locking the door behind her, and went home, and she was very worried about coming back and the implications of it. But the tra it was on my training course. But the trainer was very supportive, and I think possibly spoke to the practice and kind of asked them about best practice of low working. That's right. And uh, if you're going to do telephone assessment, for example, you haven't got the visual clues to um, help you. No, in making an assessment either. So, um, I would suggest if you do, do telephone assessments that you have your questions written down on a piece of paper in front of you. So, when somebody phones, you've got some questions to ask. Um, things like, uh, you know, uh, are you on medication? Uh, what's your history of suicide? Um, what's your history of counselling or psychotherapy? Um, things which you can actually have as trigger questions to ask. So you get some sense of the person's reality cohesion, you know, where they can actually talk to you in rapport, where there's a stimulus and a transaction, and where there's a flow in communication. Uh, because if they are um, out of touch with reality, or if they are showing, as you just said, multiple presentations, yes. then you really do need to refer on, uh, rather than think you have to take that person on. Yes, and that's, yes. That, that's okay. You know, if there's anybody who's <coughs> thinking, well, I think that's disrespectful for the client, or they, they feel nervous, or feel these feelings of incompetence, or, you know, I'm, perhaps, you know, I'm not sure if I should do that, I would say that this is being respectful to the client. It's respectful to the client. It's also about your own emotional safety as a therapist, making sure you're working within your competencies. Now, one of the things that, and perhaps we'll put that list up, 
uh, make a list and make That's a link a good for idea. it. We'll, we'll put it in the bar um, yeah. below. But one of the things that always interests me is people's experience of previous therapeutic engagements. Oh, wow. Say a little bit. Well, I, I, I sometimes reflect that if people have had a good previous experience of therapy, then the indicators possibly are that they're going to get a, a good experience in this mm. engagement. Mm. If in the past they have perceived they've had a poor experience in therapy or have been in therapy a number of times and, have, and, and say statements like, Liz, you're the third therapist I've seen, the others haven't, haven't, haven't been able to help me. Um, again, for the novice therapist, that is a kind of scary place to be. Definitely. As an experienced therapist, how would you deal with that? The, the client presents having not had a good experience of therapy multiple times. Oh. How, would, how would you work with that? Bob? More inquiry. Right. You know, the first thing I want to know is how come? I'd want to know, secondly, what were you working on with these other therapists? Thirdly, how did you leave therapy with these other therapists? Did you take umbrage and just leave? Did, was it amicable? Uh, what were the areas you were working on? What type of therapist did you have? Did you have a qualified therapist? They're all indicators to really uh, the level of functioning of the clients. Because sometimes, I, I'm agreeing with you Rory, sometimes um, people may just not get on mm. with the therapist, but usually if there's been termination of three or four therapists, it shows something about the level of functioning with the, uh, with the client and the relationship. Yes. Uh, and that's very important. And I, I, I would encourage anyone to inquire further about how come there were breakdowns with the therapist. Did you fire the therapist? Was it you that terminated? You know, what, what was this about? So, so a sense of inquiry, a sense of information gathering. Information gathering. To so make, and, and, the, and the key word here, of course, is assessment, isn't it? Mm -hmm. To make an assessment. A few words about working with people with multiple presentations. Mm -hmm. Sometimes some of my learners, the people I teach, will work with a client with emotional issues <coughs> and they'll have someone who works with issues of alcohol mm -hmm. or drug use. Yeah. I think, for me, it's important that you know that, that if you're going to work with someone who's got um, I issues that you're not capable of dealing with or you're not trained to deal with, case of capability but training is there another agency involved yeah I mean alcohol is a good one because there are many agencies that deal with counseling for people who've got drink problems hmm. same in the world of drugs yes now I encourage in fact more than encourage uh, more statement of fact for my trainees to refer on to specialist units because with all the well, in the world, trainees are not trained specifically enough sure. in these areas of addiction, yes. areas of uh, working with alcohol and drugs. They get rather general hmm. training on how to be therapists rather than a specific one. Yes. So I always encourage all my trainees to uh, refer on to special stages. Right. Um, it doesn't mean you can't take them on, but if you haven't been trained, that's a bit, if you haven't had sure. specialist training, mm. how can you work with people in these specific areas? Now, of course, you might get somebody who presents with depression, and as you work through the layers, they talk about their drink problem or their addiction problems. Mm. Now, if you've got a good enough relationship and you feel that you can read up on how to deal with alcoholism, read up to do addictions, sure. then you might decide to work with them. But I think there needs a lot of clinical thought and assessment yes. before you go ahead. Yes, I, I mean I would agree with that. Um, I mean, uh, you know, the, the the reality of the world is sometimes that that you work with a client for a, a, a number of sessions and then discover that there is an issue with yes, substance that's the reality issues, or there's a recovery from substance yeah. issues, 
And I guess it's at that point you go to your supervisor and you ask the question, am I, have I got enough knowledge? And that really is one yeah. for the supervisor to Well, you said about that, which is very, very important. Mm. That all trainees and all therapists, actually, once even when they've been accredited, need to have supervisors. That is extraordinarily important mm. because that becomes the lifeblood for the novice therapist and even for the experienced therapist to be able to go to a third person and reflect back their issues, Absolutely. their anxieties and their problems. And we and I think it's easy as as trainers to take it that everybody goes to supervision. Yeah, but right. that that's but that always isn't isn't the case. Mm. Um, and I have actually met therapists who have kind of had quite a blasé view of supervision. So I don't, I'm experienced, I don't really need it. It's like very, a very dangerous and a, and a shame, as you say. Mm. Mm. Modalities. You're a TA, you're a transactional analysis. I, I come from a personal centred position. Do you consider the therapy when thinking about the presenting issues? So if somebody came and they said, I've got a fear of flying. Yeah. Would you think of referring maybe to a CBT therapist, or would you work with it in, with 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 what you know? Well, that's a really good question, and I think the first step is to inquire. So, if we just take specifically a fear of flying, yes, then we can look at that in terms of phobias, and we can turn look at that in terms of um, doing visualization work, CBT work. And as TA uh, practitioner, we get trained in areas of CBT and visualizations. Right. However, you're right. I could, you know, I could refer to a specialisation. However, my first point of call in terms of assessment as a TA therapist, yes, is to think ego states, or put it another way around, parts of the self. So very quickly, if someone's coming from the adult part of themselves, they're operating appropriate to their age, 61 or yes, 49 yes. or whatever, uh, in the here and now. So their level of functioning uh, is related to their adult ego state capacity. Right. So if they are maintaining a robust adult, yep, yeah, that's yeah. what you're after is a, yes. a, in terms of the assessment, then they are much more likely to maintain a relationship in therapy and you're much more likely to be able to look at some of the more confused areas of the self like the unconscious or perhaps the dominant parent which yes. is bearing down on the adult so the first point of call is to look at how much they are in their adult yes. part of themselves how much they're in their unconscious part of the self and how much they're in their parent part of themselves the problem comes when a person gets stuck in a part of themselves which is different from their adult. And they sure. can't get back to their own reality in the here and now. And I, I think you bring an interesting point up about assessments in different modalities. In the person's sense of modality, I would be saying to, to trainees, anything, if, if, you, if you cannot work with this on an emotional level, uh -huh. if it does need a behavioral intervention, then most possibly you need to refer on. And I think mm. this is about the different forms of training that, that people receive in therapy, and they're, they're very varied and, and very wide. Yeah, yeah. Um, in I, our, yeah, in our final exams, for example, when they might have quite a long case study in how they work with clients, sure. they have to write a section which includes assessment. And part of what they have to look at is who they wouldn't work with sure. and who they would work with yes and you know the first elements I've said before we, we talked about them 10 minutes ago is you wouldn't work with people with psychosis sure you wouldn't work with people you weren't trained with you and we haven't mentioned this you wouldn't work with people who are relatives friends or you've had boundary issues with ah now that's a really really good that's a really good point mm. because for those of you who are watching you perhaps may not be in the world of therapy yeah. um, it would it would not be ethical healthy or a good outcome for either party yeah. if a therapist work with someone they knew. That's very important this. Yes. And so many trainees and unfortunately I don't know in your experience uh, may come to me and say 
Um, well, you know, I've taken my first or second client on. So I said, oh, that's good. Um, however, I just want to run something by and I say, yes. Uh, well, actually, this person's a friend of mine or oh. their relative or they're my brother or they're my sister yes. or yes. I'm doing for free. Ah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All these sort of areas really need to be discussed because none of those last ones I've just said will have a good ground for a good outcome. Sure. I mean, that's an interesting one, isn't it? Because most learners that have been watching counselling, doing counselling courses at college, oh, well, yes. will be working pro bono or oh, free yeah. in placements. Um, oh, yes, that way. Yes. Placements. That's different. Yes. But in, in terms of pseudo-private practice, mm. Yes, I think I think that's that's an interesting point. In that, um, you know, they're, 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 it's a, it's about a boundary, isn't it? If you're if you're offering paid practitioner work, yeah, and then you offer it for free, what does that say about you? You, I'll yes. tell you what it says. I'm not important. Yes, I'm not valuing myself. Yes, those are two twin things to say. And, and the message it gives to the client is, <laughs> well, if you mildly write down, yeah. the message is that. Well, I'm not valued by, I'm not important, and perhaps you aren't either. What sure. message were you thinking of? I'm well, not. much the same, to be honest, yeah. Bob. You know, I, I think the, the, the idea is, is that as therapists, we, we model yeah, the matter, which, which modality yeah. and way yeah. of being. Yeah. And, and it's, yeah. about, it's about the, the clients seeing that, and our boundaries are important ways of showing that way of being. Oh, absolutely, and levels of motivation. Yes. Uh, actually, because money is a good barometer around levels of motivation. Mm. People are far more motivated if there's some barter of exchange. That's, the, that's an interesting perspective. Yeah. That's interesting. And I'm sure there'll be people watching who are doing <laughs> college courses <laughs> who'll be running <laughs> to their tutor now and say, can I charge you? <laughs> oh, well, yeah. in the courses, like, I mean, when I did the count, my first counselling yes. course in 1985, yeah. I, I also, like you just talked about, I was in a placement and I, I wasn't, you know, we weren't charging anything. I'm talking about when you're in private practice. Ah, right. You know, because you have to get a website, you have to do advertising, yes. you've done four years of training, two years of training, yes. three years of training, where you paid a lot of money, yes. you have your first client. Now you're really discounting yourself, aren't you? Yes. You don't start to actually get some money back. Absolutely. I'm not talking about this area of placement, which is different. Yes. Right? The beginning, middle and end for about six months or two months or three months. Yes. I'm talking about paid psychotherapy, yes. which I'm glad you said. Yes. So, so I think that's that's a really that's a really interesting point. Initially meeting with clients, yeah. sometimes they in denial yeah. of their own truths. Yeah. One of the skills of assessment yeah. is to be able to kind of listen to the process yeah. as as well as the narrative. Yeah. What are the kind of things that are, are sometimes unsaid but you can hear or you can pick up, do you think? Anger. Yes. <laughs> That's a very good one. <laughs> <laughs> I said that with great relish, yeah. but I didn't. Yes. But, um, no, seriously, you know, uh, somebody comes to you and talks about, say, depression, for example, which we all know is anger turned inwards. Mm -hmm. yeah? yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, they're not uh, taking ownership of their resentments or their fury or what they're holding beneath the surface. Um, uh, and you know in a way that that's really important to get out, but they could easily be denying it. And so for the beginning therapist, again, you need to look beneath the surface. Absolutely. Body language is a very good way of looking at incongruity between what a person says yes. and how they present. I, I think incongruities is a really good therapeutic word. It's a contradiction. Mm. So, I, if, so if I were to say to you, Bob, I'm really happy about this. You look very happy. I am very happy. <laughs> there's, there's an incongruity, yeah. incongruence between how I'm speaking mm. and how I'm being. And that's... Mm. that's Picking up on the, the process, yeah, and perhaps saying, oh, when I'm when I'm listening to you, it feels like it sounds like that you're quite angry, and I wonder what that might be about, possibly. Yeah, yeah. and that's a really really important point. Another point I just want to briefly 
say in terms of assessment before yes. we come to the end. And that's around sexuality. Ah. Oh. Yeah. Um, so what about, you know, if someone's attracted to someone else? Yes. So you, you see your first client and, and you find yourself very attracted to that person. Yes. And they come in and they say, you know, I want to explore my unhappiness and specifically in my relationship with my husband and then you find out they're having an affair and not getting their sexual needs met for example and you're very attracted to this person yes would you work with them no. that's a good question for a beginning trainee or a novice psychotherapist yes and and, and, the, and it, okay. goes, it goes across the it goes across the sexuality boundaries isn't it we, must, mm. you know we, we might there might be a thought it might be male female but it could be female female male male so yes can can you work with your own desires your own erotic transference in, in own erotic yeah. transference with this client that's a really good point the other thing is about availability yes, yes. i i think that I, when i when i used to work um, for a charity yeah. we had a, quite a transient population and one of the things in the assessment that used to come up was people who may only be staying for a week, or two weeks, three weeks, and then moving on to another town, another city. My personal view is, is that if somebody is only going to be around for three weeks, yeah. can, can they form a therapeutic relationship? Can you do any therapy in three weeks? Yes, that's right. It's a very, very, you might, there's brief, that's a very good question. Though, can it, you might believe in brief, brief therapy, but three sessions, wow. Yes. You know. So you have to yes. ask these questions. Absolutely. And one, that, one that's, that came up for me a good few years ago, which taught me a valuable lesson, oh. was health, physical health. Yes, very good. Yeah, yeah. And I had a client who was very unwell, but really needed therapy, really really was keen on therapy. But she would, she, it wasn't a case of avoidance. She, she had general, genuine physical needs that, some, some days parts of her body would not work properly and she couldn't Good. get here. Good. And that was about, for me, Bob, and I don't know where you are with this, about real, realistic contracting and realistic progression of the therapy. Yeah, yeah. Contracting is really important. Yes. Goals, outcomes. Another, another couple of um, areas I'd just like to briefly say from two trainees I was thinking about only last week. One of them said to me, um, you know, but you, Bob. Uh, you know, being the trainer. Yes. Um, I've taken on this client, but I got a real problem. I said, "Yes, this is the first first client." Yes. So what's the problem? And he said, "Well, I don't like him. Oh, I don't like this person. I just don't like this person. Right. And I don't think I can work with this person because I don't like them. And I just want them out the door." So the question was, should you always be working with people you like and what about people you really dislike does that affect the therapy mm. do you say oh well I really don't like you so I can't work with you or do you persevere uh, what's your thoughts on that well I mean I think I think we're in the territory of transference aren't we we're, we're well, we talked about last <laughs> last video <laughs> yeah, I was talking about last video <laughs> but I always think that if you if you meet somebody and you dislike them you're either seeing things in yourself that are yeah, being mirrored yeah. that you don't like about Could yourself, all, yeah. or alternatively, you're seeing things about other people that have been in your life or are currently in your life mm. that may be triggering you yeah. to, to, to for those for those angry thoughts. It may be you might have someone. A classic one would be someone who reminded you of your parents, your mother yeah. or your father, a teacher at school, mm. an ex-partner. Mm. Um, but also the idea, I guess, that sometimes it's very hard to look in the mirror and if you've got someone who is like you in their attitudes and behaviours, sometimes we don't like to see ourselves reflected. Yeah. And that, I think, is about supervision. I also think it's about therapy. therapy. So it's okay to work with people even if you don't like them? I, I think so, but I, I think that you might need to up supervision ratios yeah. and you have to be absolutely ruthlessly candid and audit yourself. I agree with you. And just going briefly back to contracts, goals and outcomes. Yes. And TA were very big on contracts and 
Uh, it helps because then you know where you are in the treatment process. And of course, if they've achieved their contract and goal, perhaps that's a, a really good clue for ending. Yes, absolutely. So I hope you found this useful. One thing I would say before I, I finish, I'm a great believer in gut feeling. It always has to be backed up with some thinking at some point. But if you're assessing a client and you're getting a, a very strong feeling, there will be a valid reason for that. It might not be in your awareness at that point, but I would write that feeling down when the clients are gone. If you're a visual person, I'd draw the feeling, and then I'd be thinking about going to my supervisor and saying, when I was talking to this client, I did the assessment, but also, look, I've, I've, I've written this feeling down, I've drawn this feeling. There is no shame in doing that. No. And that is, in fact, a sign, in my view, of a competent, competent, thoughtful practitioner. I think that's a wonderful way to end this uh, short video on assessment. Uh, I really agree with you there. So on those wise words. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank for watching. you. Bye bye.